Hi, it's Pastor Jim, and I have a question for you. It's a question you may not ask yourself often, but some people do. The question is, are you happy? Are you really happy? Are you happy with the world? Are you happy with yourself? Well, if you answered no, you're not alone, because most people in this world are not happy with themselves. According to a World Happiness Report from 2019, sponsored by the University of California. Now, this is an international survey taken in 156 countries, and what they discovered was that negative feelings are rising around the world. By the way, the questions were based on things like income, freedom, trust, uh, health, um, life expectancy, social support, a generosity, and, and a general sense of well-being. <laughs> Whatever that is. Do you have a general sense of well-being? Anyway, look at what the survey concluded. One trend is very clear. Negative feelings, worry, sadness, anger, have been rising around the world and are up 27% in the last few years. Now, this survey has been taken every year since 2005, but I found this kind of funny. It was not given in 2021 or 2020 uh, due to the pandemic and the anticipation that the results would be negatively skewed. <laughs> Isn't that kind of strange? I mean, you're trying to find if people are happy and you realize, uh, no, they're so miserable, we can't even ask them if they're happy. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, here's an additional question. If people are so unhappy, especially with themselves, why don't they change? And the answer is because the power to change is one of the most elusive powers in the whole world. Uh, think uh, New Year's Eve resolutions. You know, 50% of the world that says make them, 30 days later, only 5% keep them. Think sales of self-help and self-improvement products. You know how much you spend each year on self-help stuff? Globally, $156 billion. <laughs> That's right, with a B. The truth is the average person in the world and the average person in Dubai is miserable. They feel bad about themselves, and they'll do almost anything or pay almost any amount for somebody to help them change. You know, when we talk about surveys, it's easy for us to think we're just talking about other people. I mean, they are unhappy, they don't like themselves. But what about you and me? One last question. How many days over the last 30 days have you felt good about yourself? Then let me ask you, why haven't we changed? It was the brilliant author and professor uh, who's a Christian, C.S. Lewis, who said, no one knows how bad he is until he tries really hard to be good. You know what he's talking about? I sure do. Today and over the next few weeks, we're starting a new series, and we're going to see that the only one who can bring real, radical, lasting, deep change is God. He has the power to make each one of us brand new. You know, in one of his books, a best-selling author, Max Lucado, tells of a time years ago when he underwent a serious heart procedure. He was suffering from tachycardia, rapid heartbeat. Same problem, by the way, that our oldest daughter, the one who's the mother of, of the granddaughter, has. Lucado was scheduled for a cardiac ablation where they use a laser to go in and correct the problem. And he was understandably a little nervous about it. So as he was wheeled into the operating room, his doctor didn't help any when he asked him, any final questions? Oh, <laughs> final, not the best word for a surgeon to use. So Max said, uh, you're burning the inside of my heart, right? Uh, uh, correct, said the surgeon. You intend to kill the misbehaving cells, yes? That's the plan. Now trying to calm yourself with a little humor, Lucado said, well, as long as you're in there, do you think you could uh, put a blowtorch on the anger and greed and selfishness? Sorry, said the surgeon. That's out of my pay grade. Lucado concludes, indeed it is, but it's not out of God's. He's in the business of changing hearts. Anybody here need a new heart? If so, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know that not just people around the world, but people right here who are listening to this talk, and even the person who's giving it. Lord, we can struggle at times with feelings of, just negative feelings, of guilt, and shame, and remorse. Father, so often we say or do things and we think, well, why did I do that? That's not the person I want to be. Lord, I pray you would help us today and over the next few weeks to hear what you have to say about how we can be the people that we were really made to be, the people that we want to be. So, Father, be our teacher, not other can, and help us, Lord, that today we begin to learn how we can become more like Jesus and less like our old sinful selves. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Well, listen, this is going to be a wonderful series, and I hope you won't miss a single week of it. And what we're going to be doing is looking at the most interesting and relevant passages about life change in the New Testament. And today we're going to begin by looking at a passage that's been a great help to me. It's Galatians chapter 5. Now, Galatians was a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to some churches in the northern part of what today would be uh, modern Turkey. And in the process, he really helps us in this, about this topic of change. Look what he says. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And here's the part that I want to talk about. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That word flesh is a word which has to do with the inner nature, our inner sinful nature that we're born with. I mean, if he wanted to talk about our fleshly bodies, it was another word he could use. But this word sarks, most of the time when Paul uses it, is talking about, matter of fact, it's even translated as sinful nature in, in many New Testaments. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Holy Spirit against the flesh, that sin nature. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things as a Christian you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, get ready to hold your nose, are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and Paul says I could go on and on and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So someone who practices these things and these are part of their regular lifestyle and, and they don't feel guilty when they do them, Paul says you had a serious problem with that. But what's Paul saying that we should be like? Well, look at this. This is the good list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, there it is again, with its passions and desires. And then here's a really important statement. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, just by way of background, the, the whole letter that Paul writes essentially is about two conflicts. The first one that he writes about is a conflict between those Judaizers, as they were called. There were these men who were following him around, and they were basically telling people that, that Jesus was fine, but they also needed to uh, abide by all the rules of the Old Testament. They were called Judaizers. And Paul said, these people are, these people are evil. It's wrong because they're adding to the cross. They're saying that you have to earn your salvation when the whole message of Jesus and and those who knew him and followed him, was that only his sacrifice on the cross can purchase our salvation. Uh, so that's one conflict. It's not the one we're going to talk about. The one we want to talk about is the conflict he brings up in Galatians chapter 5. It's a conflict, he says, between our old sin nature and our new nature in Christ. He's basically saying that we're all born with that old nature, and when we become a Christian, um, that old nature is done away with. The problem is that we then need to begin to live by that new person we are in Christ. Uh, let me show you. His, essentially, here's the summary of what he's going to say. To experience life change, we must be born again. I mean, if you don't come to know Christ, follow him and, and by faith in him and realize that his death on the cross is what makes the change possible, then it's not going to happen. So you must be born again to receive a new nature. It's then that our slavery to sin is broken and the fruit of the Spirit begins to grow within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's what's often called spiritual transformation. Now, the change that God wants to make in us is he wants us to have these nine amazing characteristics, this fruit of the Spirit. And look at this list again that we read. I mean, it's love, not just any love, but that agape love, that selfless giving love. It's the love that Jesus has for each of us. It's the love that God had in sending Christ to come and be our Savior. It says in John 3, for God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Um, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience. It's kindness, it's, it's goodness, deep, genuine, lasting goodness, good to everyone you need. It's, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's having self-control. And here in Galatians 5, Paul contrasts that with what? With the works of the flesh. 
And, and you know, I never really noticed it, but I, even though I've taught on this a lot, but I, I, I put these two lists side by side, and, and it may be just uh, uh, nothing that was really intended, but it certainly jumped out at me. You can almost see the contrast between these things. I mean, there's love compared to sexual immorality. That's a big difference, you know? It's not just uh, um, uh, love the one you with, but it's loving a person and them loving you and being faithful to that person. It's, it's joy versus impurity and sensuality. It's peace instead of idolatry and uh, witchcraft or sorcery. As there's not finding peace from seeking Satan, finding peace from the one who can really give it God. It's patience instead of enmity. I mean, you can go through the whole list and see that. And, and, and two things I want to call to your attention. Number one, and it's probably a simple thing, but let me ask you, who would I rather be? Would I rather be the list on the left or would I rather be the list on the right? Uh, who would I rather be married to? Who would I rather have as parents or friends or flatmates or coworkers? You know? Who would say, oh, no, no, I want a boss who you know, communicates through fits of anger. Ah! You know, that's not, I don't, no, thank you. No, I would rather have someone who has changed into a person self-control and gentleness. I mean, I want to be married to a wife that sleeps around. No, I want to be married to a husband who comes home and gets bombed every night and, you know, I have to put him to bed. No, that's not what I want. So that's the change we all desire, is to become more like Christ. And, and so if you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, um, yeah, I want to urge you to become one, not just because it will give you an eternal destiny in heaven, but because it'll change you on earth and give you a life that you'll, you'll be so much happier and people around you will be so much happier. That's essentially what Paul's saying here in Galatians chapter 5. Now, uh, one other thing I want to mention before we move on, and that's a quote I saw of Tim Keller's. I think this is so good and so helpful, what he explains. Tim Keller, by the way, is a wonderful pastor and author from New York City. He writes, Galatians 5 does not say the fruit of the Spirit and the weeds of the flesh. It says fruit and works. Why would Paul mix these metaphors? Because the works of the flesh is something we do. It's, it's, it's something that we seek after. It's something we, you know, we hide away. It's something we plan and do, these, these, these evil things. Or sometimes it's that sin nature that erupts in us, the, the anger, the, the hurtful words, the, the physically striking out. The fruit of the Spirit is something that God does, not us. I mean, we allow Him. We, we, we give ourselves to the Lord and allow him to control us, as we're going to see in just a minute. But Keller says it's like a gardener tending a beautiful garden. A gardener doesn't make things grow. He simply creates the conditions through which the power of the seed is released. We cannot make ourselves loving or joyful or peaceful. We have to crucify what we do by our old nature and allow the Holy Spirit to produce in us the qualities of our new nature. Now, how exactly does that happen? Well, in the time we have left, let me give you three suggestions that are found here in Galatians chapter 5. And those three things are what? Number one, it's based on love. Number two, change is powered by the Holy Spirit. And three, there has to be a crucifixion. So let's look at these things together. First of all, how change happens. It's based or has its foundation in agape love. Uh, Jesus' love for us, our love for him, and our love for others. As a matter of fact, there's an amazing verse in Galatians here, chapter 2, probably one of the most important verses in all the New Testament. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Look at it with me. Paul writes and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Here it is. Read this with me. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. Wow. That's what makes me want to become a new person. That's what gives me the, the motivation, the, the purpose. That's when I wake up in the morning and say, I don't want to be like I used to be. I want to be different. I want to be because I'm loved by God in Christ. I, I mean, it says in the New Testament, for, for God so loved us. It says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't like he was waiting for us to become good, and then he decided to love us. He loves us. And he came, and that love changes us, makes us different. And it's not just as, as a result of his love for us. We love him. Look what Paul writes in verse 6. He says, For in Christ Jesus the law counts for nothing, but only faith working through love. It's not the Old Testament law that's going to change you. It's the faith you have in Jesus and the love you have for him as a result of the love he has for us. And it's not only 
a, a God and me thing, but it's also me and the people around me. Look what he says in verse 13. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. As the other people serve me, I feel God's love through them. And when I do something for someone else, I'm expressing God's love to them. It, it's a wonderful cascading experience in community. And it's so, so important. Love changes us. Let me give you a good example. Let me show you a picture. Uh, see if, see if, tell me, do you know who this is? <laughs> yeah, hey, believe it or not, that's me. And, and next to me is my beautiful bride, Alanda. And uh, this is actually July 27th, 1974. That's right, almost 50 years ago. And you know what? I cannot tell you how wonderful it has been to be married to this woman. She's incredible. She's beautiful. She was beautiful then. She's beautiful now. But she's not only beautiful on the outside, she has an incredible inner beauty. Uh, she, she, she's, she's so loving to me and, and patient and forgiving. She's so joyful. She's so kind. She's truly the, the goodest person I've ever known. Uh, yeah, that's right. Those are all fruit of the Spirit that, live, that God has produced in Alanda. And as a result, our love for each other is, is one that has made me not have any problem being faithful to my wife, or I believe her faithful to me. That's what love does. It changes us, and it makes us people who can do things that we may thought we never could have done. Or even when temptation comes, we're able to say, no, no, my love is greater for my, this person, for my God, than for that, that thing. Well, so love is the basis. What's the second thing? It's powered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and there's three metaphors that Paul uses, and he actually spends more time talking about this uh, than anything else as it relates to change. So we ought to pay close attention to this. And the first metaphor he uses is this idea of walk. He says, walk by the Spirit. Remember, I, we, we looked at that. And this word walk, interesting word, it means to walk about or with every step, essentially. It's a compound word of the word um, everywhere or all and the idea of a path. So it says, anywhere your path takes you, you need to be doing this thing. And it's translated in <clears throat> different translations by live, conduct your life, throughout the day is one I paraphrase. And it's a present tense in Greek, which means it's an ongoing thing. It's not like I did it today, I'm not gonna do it, you know, but I'm not gonna do it tomorrow, or I didn't do it yesterday. It's this idea that every day I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna walk through the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The point is, I have to stay in constant contact with the Spirit in order that I can practice His presence, and therefore, I have His power in my life. Can I give you an illustration that I hope you'll never forget? Uh, yeah, you know where it comes from? <laughs> it comes from my toothbrush. <laughs> I, know, I know, that sounds weird, but this, this is my toothbrush. Uh, it's actually my, my old toothbrush. Uh, this, by the way, is my latest toothbrush, so I have two toothbrushes here. And the reason I'm showing them to you is because I want to show how familiar they are, similar they are. Uh, they all have kind of what looks like little buttons down the middle, and you can see this one's kind of worn because I've used it so much. This one's is newer. But this is the one I want to talk to you about. This lesson came from my old toothbrush. Uh, I bought this toothbrush and, you know, used it for several months, and this brushing is normal. And one day I was brushing, uh, uh, Lando was brushing next to me, and she looked over at me and she said, uh, why don't you turn it on? And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, do you see the buttons? And I said, yeah, they're for, they like help you hold the toothbrush. She said, press the top one, and I did. And this is what happened. <laughs> Can you believe that? It's an electric toothbrush. I've never seen such a small tooth electric toothbrush. I thought the hand, heavy handle was just for holding it better. You know, better it's back there in the back. No, it was an electric toothbrush. I had been brushing without the power of the toothbrush. And I thought to myself, isn't that incredible? And I, I was reminded, I think that's a lot like the Holy Spirit. When I try to live my life without the Holy Spirit's power. And I love the fact that, that God is with us even in the most mundane of things. He wants to be with us throughout the day. Throughout all my relationships, when I'm at work, when I'm at home, when I'm on the metro, when I'm on the beach, when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm working out, wherever it is, have the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope you'll remember that one. It certainly has helped me to remember it. Okay, well, the second metaphor he uses is being led by the Spirit. Not only do we walk by the power of the Spirit, but we're led by the Spirit. And he mentions that this in Galatians 5, 17. He says, for everything that the flesh desires goes against the Spirit and the Spirit against uh, the flesh. There's a constant battle raging between these two that prevents you as a Christian from doing the new things because you keep being pulled back towards the old things. And he says, but, but here's the solution. But when you are led by the Spirit, you no longer held hostage by the law. In other words, the law that says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, that makes me just want to do it all the more. No, Paul says, 
enjoy the wonderful grace and freedom of having the Holy Spirit with you and, and follow where he leads you. That's what you need to do. Essentially, I think what he's encouraging us to do is get up every morning, and the first thing on our mind needs to not be breakfast, that's usually what I'm thinking of, or not be, you know, what am I going to wear, ladies? Or, you know, if you're a kid, what can I get away with? The first thing on our mind needs to be, today, today, this day, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit control my life. And I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit uh, in every decision. I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit uh, whenever I'm, I'm tempted to go do something that I shouldn't. I'm going to realize I can't take the Spirit with me there. Um, what I just said was not of the Spirit. I need to apologize. I need to back up. And I need to get my vocabulary and my direction back with the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, I saw this the other day. I thought it was so clever. Someone uh, put this little thing together. It says, the Holy Spirit is like having your very own life GPS. Isn't that good? Follow him and you will never, ever get lost or end up in a place you shouldn't be. Yeah. Well, the last metaphor uh, is also really helpful too. And that's the one where he says, you need to walk. Uh, there's walk, led, and the last one is live. Live in step with the Spirit. That's a fascinating word. It's actually a military term, stoiako, which means to, to march in line or, or keep in step, to follow exactly. And, uh, and he says, this is what you need to do. You, you need to have the power. You need to realize that you have a leader. But you also need to realize you have somebody who's right there with you, actually in you. And when I read this, I immediately thought of something that I hadn't thought about in years, and that's the three-legged race. <laughs> Have you ever done one of those? Well, I was, used to be a youth pastor. I used to do them a lot, all, all the time. Here's a picture that I really like. This comes, believe it or not, from the World Three-Legged Race Contest a Championship. Did you know there was a world championship in three-legged? I didn't know it either. And these guys are great, huh? I mean, I, I, I never made any, covered any ground like they are. I mean, they have really practiced. They know what they're doing. They are in, a, so it's such unison. They can actually run together. Isn't that amazing? Now, most of the time when I was doing three-legged races, I look more like these two knuckleheads. As a matter of fact, I still can't figure out why the one guy is facing going the other direction. Did they, did they think they were going to do it better that way? Now, I know it's another kind of silly example of a serious thing. But I'm thinking tomorrow morning when you get up and, and you finish brushing your teeth and you want to know you have the power and you've prayed, Lord, lead me, I want you to think about the fact that you've got the Holy Spirit right here tied to your leg. And every step you take all day, the Holy Spirit is going to be right there with you. And you can either be pulling against him, you can be lagging, trying to be a dead weight, or you can get in unison with him and you guys can run just like those guys in that first picture. Simple? Yeah, but I hope helpful. Well, so it's based on love, it's powered by the Spirit, and number three, and this is perhaps the most difficult thing to hear of all, it requires a crucifixion. Paul saved it to last. He says it in verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, that inner nature, with its passions and desires. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, that's in the past tense. This is not something that, uh, that, that's going to happen in the future when we get to heaven. This is something that Paul says has actually happened to us right here, right now, when we became a believer in Christ. And, and therefore, we need to think about this regularly. And, and I know when we think of the word crucifixion, we, I don't know if we know how to relate it to maybe a movie a, 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 we've seen of, of Jesus, uh, maybe you know, a gold cross around her neck, I, you know, maybe a crucifix on a church wall that we used to see. But crucifixion, when, when Paul wrote these people, they, they knew the horrible, ugly truth of what real crucifixion was. It was a common executional practice in the Roman world. They used to sometimes line roads with crucified people when there'd been a rebellion. And so there were no partial crucifixions. There were no second time crucifixions. Oh yeah, I was crucified. I think I'll get crucified again. No, crucifixion was total, final, complete, and thorough. And I believe sometimes we, as followers of Jesus, don't take verse 24 seriously enough. I think we... I think we consider the fact that, you know, I'm gonna, I was crucified, but right now I've kind of gotten off the cross and I'm kind of doing my own thing. I'm going to go get back on the cross later one of these days. No, no, that's not how it works. When, when we follow Christ, we need to realize that who we used to be is dead, gone. I mean, DOA, never to be risen again. And, and I know, I know we're all going to struggle until we get to heaven. I know there's the memory, there's the smell, there's the taint of our old nature still in us. But Paul was very clear here. He says, you need to realize that when you became a follower of Christ, your old nature died. It was crucified. And without a crucifixion, 
you're not really a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, I love pictures. They really help me. And, and there's a, a contemporary painter that I've started following. I really like his paintings. This is uh, one of them. I, I love the way Christ is literally hanging. So often you see him against the cross like it was no big deal to stay against the cross. It was extremely difficult, uh, as if you know anything about crucifixion. But anyway, I, I like the painting, and here's when I think and look at this painting, and I was reading this passage. This is what it made me think of. My sin nature on the cross with Jesus. I mean, right there on his chest. I'm dying for Jim's sin nature. I'm dying for Alanda's sin nature. I'm dying for your sin nature. And, and so this is how we need to think about our sin nature. For Christians, it shouldn't be a choice. Am I going to live by the list on the right or the list on the left? We ought to only focus on the list on the left and realize that, yeah, sometimes we're going to, we're going to perhaps look back longingly at the list on the right. Sometimes we're going to want to even reach over there. But we live on the left. So by way of application, let me ask you one last thing. Does this actually happen? Can it happen in your life? Does change happen? Is what I've been telling you true? Can I, can you, can anyone who comes to Christ experience this spiritual transformation? And the answer is absolutely. You know, over the next few weeks, we're going to ask people who have experienced this change to share their stories with us. And today we've asked one of the lovely women in our church, Sid Gagalian, if she would come and tell us what happened to her. So let me pray first, and then we'll hear from Sid. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for, for loving us, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us, for the fact that as a result of us putting our faith in him and asking you, Lord, to forgive us our sins, uh, of us turning and repenting of our sins and seeking to follow Jesus, we can become this new person we've been talking about. And, and Lord, I pray right now for every person who's listening to this, uh, that, Lord, they would understand that this can happen in their lives, that, that the discouragement, the depression, perhaps the anxiety, um, the guilt, the shame, the remorse that we all struggle with at times, Father, we can be free from that. That does not have to be the tenor of our lives, the, the pattern of our lives. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would help us to listen carefully to what our sister Sid has to say about the change that came about in her life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My father had different wives at the same time. We're 13 siblings. So, you know, you, you don't have the full attention of your father um, growing up. You feel outcast because everyone else has their family. Everyone else, parents are married, you know, and, and, and I'm the only one um, within my classmates and my friends who doesn't have a father that I can call my own. I, I really, I was so angry with him, with him and my mom. So I have to try things differently, like just to forget things, forget my problems, forget what I'm facing at home. It was um, one time that uh, someone invited me in a youth camp um, and someone was preaching about Jesus. My life was in, in chaos and I'm, I'm a mess. And for me, that was the time that God met me. Being a believer, being, being that I that I known God, I know that I have to do something and, you know, for my father to be saved because no matter what, Jesus loves him. No matter what, Jesus cares for him. And so one afternoon, out of nowhere, I was led to share the gospel to him. And I witnessed how he repented. He cried and he just accepted the Lord Jesus. And uh, days after that, he died. He passed away. I'm sorry, but whenever I share this, I can't help but appreciate the things that God has done for my father. You know, I believe God is a God of many chances. 
I know my dad is up there in heaven with, with Jesus. Yeah. There is so much more to this life than being angry. Then there's so much more in this life than being unforgiving. You know, it's, it's the power of God that, that changes us inside out.